The Hebrew scripture reading today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 145, verses 8 to 18. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways, and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. The Gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down with his, there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is a uh, critical time for our nation and for the church. 
We wonder where we fit in a fast-moving world, a fast-changing world, how we relate to a polarizing community that seems less interested in the gospel than in the self. Jesus lived in a world of political domination and polarization, of ultra-conservative religious influence, of deep divisions between the haves and the have-nots, of crushing poverty for most of the people around him in rural Galilee. This morning we heard two of Jesus' iconic miracle stories from John's Gospel. The story of the feeding of 5,000 people is the only miracle story that all four evangelists include in their Gospels. It's a foundational story about Jesus' concern for people. After Jesus gets in trouble in Jerusalem for healing a lame man on the Sabbath and asserting his divinity as the Son of God, he heads back home and over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Details are important for John, so he lets us know the sea is also called the Sea of Tiberias, where the Roman Emperor rules things, and he quickly contrasts that dominating and impoverishing power by mentioning that the Passover festival that celebrates God's abundance and liberation is coming up soon. A large crowd is gathering to hear him, so Jesus heads up the mountain and sits down with his disciples, and the crowd follows, just like they followed Moses in the wilderness. This is poor country. These are poor people. Many of them are subsistence farmers. So he asks Philip, where are we going to buy enough bread to feed these people? Philip answers the way we might. We don't have enough money. How much will it cost? Who's going to pay for it? Does that sound familiar? It's how we're conditioned to think. But Jesus is showing us the economy of God's kingdom. Peter's brother Andrew spots a small boy who was smart and brought his own lunch. He grabs him and yells, here's a little bit of food, but it's not anywhere near enough to feed everyone. Poor kid standing there surrounded by a bunch of rough looking men staring down at his lunch. The disciples are out of options, so Jesus takes charge, tells them to have the crowd, sits down. The Greek says to recline. At a banquet at that time, wealthy people ate lying down, expecting abundance. And the place where he has them lie down isn't a rocky mountain slope. It's like a hayfield ready to cut. Another picture of abundance. Jesus takes the kid's lunch, and like he does at the Last Supper, he gives thanks to God and hands it out to the crowd and everyone eats their fill. When they finish, Jesus tells them to gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And they collect 12 baskets of leftovers because wasting this food would steal it from the mouths of poor, hungry people. Leftover food for leftover people, the people Jesus cares so much about. As the crowd watches, Jesus takes a child's lunch and turns it into a banquet for a multitude. And they begin to see him as the prophet who is to come into the world, the new Moses. This time not just with God's backing, but with God's full nature, willing and able to intervene in nature with the Creator's power. They've had enough to eat, their physical hunger is satisfied, but their spiritual hunger isn't gone because this demonstration of power makes them want more, makes them reach out for him to force him to be their king. But Jesus slips away and heads back up the mountain alone, leaving the disciples to deal with the crowd. The sun's gone down now, and Jesus hasn't come down yet, so the disciples take their boat and head back to Capernaum without, without him. Across the open water, rowing a leaky old boat against strong wind and rough seas. 
After a few dark miles, they see a human figure walking on the sea toward them, and they're terrified because the sea is dangerous and ghosts are evil. Their fear is real, and I don't care how modern we are. If we were miles from land in the dark, out on rough water in a small open boat, and we saw someone coming toward us walking on the water, well, we'd feel exactly what they're feeling. So Jesus calls out to calm their fear, it's me, don't be afraid. The Greek is ego eimi, I am. That's what Moses heard at the burning bush. Jesus says, I am a lot. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the gate for the sheep, and I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine. I am the one you are looking for. As they fight the wind and the waves, the disciples yell at him to get in the boat, out of danger, under control, and suddenly they're back on the land. Don't we sometimes do that, try to keep Jesus safe and under control? John never says he gets back into the boat. Instead of miracle stories, John's gospel gives us signs, seven of them in all, beginning with making wine out of water at a wedding and ending with raising a very dead Lazarus. These seven signs are truly miraculous. John chooses them strategically to prove the claim he bases his gospel on, that Jesus the Christ is the word of God who was in the beginning with God. But proofs have their own problems, especially today. Signs have a miraculous element to them, supernatural interventions in our world of scientific order. John's original hearers would have been more receptive to the miracle, but we who think we know so much more than they did have trouble with the supernatural. And sometimes focusing on the miracle gets in the way of the truly miraculous. We can get hung up on the extraordinary occurrence and miss the true miracle. We get caught up with Jesus producing amazing quantities of bread and fish and we miss the truly miraculous part that a truly human being could represent by his words and deeds such a sign of hope and healing that hundreds of needy people would follow him around the countryside and feel their hunger for the bread of life had been satisfied. We get caught up with Jesus walking on the water and not sinking, and we miss the miracle that his presence among ordinary, insecure, timid people could calm their anxieties and empower them to go where they were afraid to walk before. In the end, some of them to their own deaths. We focus on a dead body coming alive and we miss that as they journeyed with the crucified one, this disciple community was enabled and empowered to find hope on the far side of despair, faith that could live with doubt, and the courage to live beyond the sting of death. Douglas John Hall suggests that when we see the thing that's literally incredible, unbelievable, as miraculous, we run the risk of losing sight of the wonder of divine grace that permeates the whole of life, and we wonder, dear God, why don't you do miracles anymore? So are they finished? Or are there still miracles in our lives? Maybe we're not paying attention. Let me assure you, God is at work here and now, right here in our village, and Jesus calls us to be part of that work, reaching out to the community to do amazing things. Let's not miss the real miracles around us. New vaccines today are saving lives, making the coronavirus survivable for many people. 
And don't forget the extraordinary work that health professionals in our hospitals are doing every day to bring COVID-19 patients back to health. As part of the UCC's mental health network, the welcoming, inclusive, supportive, and engaged for mental health congregations, the acronym is WISE, those congregations are springing up, supporting the mental health of their members and other people. And some of our churches are pioneering efforts to put people to work and to pay off people's medical debt. Many other miraculous things are happening around us every day. Are we paying attention? And Jesus is calling each of us to be that small child who helps to make God's work possible right here, right now. Even though what we have to offer can seem so small, when each of us combines our own small loaves and fishes with everyone else's, imagine what other miracles we can do together as a church. And when we join together in that work as Christ's hands and feet, we are living proof that God is live and powerful and active right here in our time and place. And in a world filled with anger and disbelief, that's a real miracle. Let's pray. Lord of life and of our lives, keep us working hand in hand every day to make your realm a reality here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.